we have a treasurer, she will turn uh, such a title, just arrived in the PhD, and she will talk about uh, on the integrability of the Eternal and beyond. Okay, so hi everybody, and thank you to be here. Thank you for inviting me to give a seminar. Uh, so I'll, I wanted to present to you what I worked uh, on in this last uh, few years, uh, so during the end of my PhD and the last year, while I was in uh, uh, Lvanov, where I continued uh, my uh, sort of what I studied during the PhD. So I tried to see uh, the a generic uh, and general talk and try to motivate why we started uh, what we started and I hope that you will enjoy the talk. So here is uh, the plan, we'll go through a brief introduction where we present uh, uh, the, this airy kernel and what we can do through this kernel and why it's uh, so a pop is uh, such a popular object uh, in uh, classical integral systems and integrable probability models. And then we will skip to a recent general generalization of this kernel that is called the finite temperature version of the Erie kernel. Which is temperature comes from uh, uh, physics essentially and pre Fermi's um, model. And uh, well, for the, such a generalization, we will see that the properties that we had for the classical one are kept in some way, and um, this was known and well studied in the last uh, 20 years, I would say. And finally, the part three and part four concerns the work that I have done. So the first part in collaboration with uh, Thomas Butler and my PhD advisor, Mattia Capazzo, on higher order finite temperature kernels. So they went to define higher order objects and uh, to prove uh, some of the properties that you had in the classical case, uh, standard, uh, first order, uh, to, to, to this higher order. And in the second part, I will go briefly to the results that we had um, with uh, Tom Clay, Gabriel Glasner, and Julio Ruzza that are still on war uh, ongoing <laughs> um, in the uh, Université Catholique de Louvain-Lenoeuvre. And these are instead, uh, well, an only generalization of this finite temperature kernel, but in a totally different sense, in the sense that we will, we will consider finite rank of perturbation of the object of the finite temperature kernel and see what happens in that case. So let's start with the introduction. So what is the Erie kernel? The Erie kernel is um, this uh, function here of two variables, k, a, i, x, y. It can be defined in uh, this two equivalent way, either with this formula or this formula. And uh, who is inside uh, this a, i is the Erie function. So now for us, the Erie function will be the classical uh, rapidly decaying uh, solution at plus infinity that is real of the Erie equation. That is this uh, standard uh, RDE here. So well, uh, you can write down uh, the Erie function in uh, this way with this integral representation. And uh, well, it resembles to something like this. That. So it's uh, the case uh, as an exponential function at plus infinity, and it has uh, this really nasty behavior at minus infinity. Uh, now, with this kernel, what we can do is to construct an integral operator, k Erie. That is so just in a standard way, it acts on function f by integrating uh, away the y variable. Okay? So now, once you have an integral operator, we can see that through the standard uh, theory of, determin of determinantal point process, you can define indeed a determinantal point process. And so this is what uh, is uh, uh, indeed the main interest of uh, considering the airy kernel in the sense that you can define through that just a random configuration of uh, points on the real line, and this is really what we want uh, to study and we are going to talk about um, in the rest of the talk. So there is a, a very uh, well-known result, well, I said it's Stoshnikov, but it was uh, known from before that um, this, uh, if you have uh, an emission locally traced what operator with uh, this property here, then you can define uniquely a determinant of one process. So, uh, random configuration on, on the real line in, in this case. So, random configuration of points on the real line such that they are completely determined by the correlation functions. And this correlation function 
are written very explicitly in terms of the return that you just defined. Okay, so the cake correlation function rho x1 to k is given by this uh, finite size determinant where you take your uh, kernel, k alien, and you evaluate it at xi, xj for ij from 1 to k. Um, now, this uh, determinantal point process uh, are uh, studied from many, many years, and well, one of the points is now you want to study this strong configuration of points on the real line, you want to know other quantities uh, other than correlation function, and one of the quantities that is mainly be studied is uh, uh, the probability distribution function of the largest particle, for example, when it exists. So it turned out that uh, for the Airy process, so when you take this uh, kernel here as the Airy kernel, your uh, random configuration of, of points are have two properties. Uh, have almost surely an infinite number of points, so it will be configuration of, uh, with an infinite number of points, and they almost surely have a uh, largest point. So it makes sense to define this probability distribution function of the largest particle in the configuration that you have. And uh, this is given by a freedom determinant, a freedom determinant of our operator Ka Airy when restricted on a semi-infinite interval s to plus infinity. Okay, so this is now just uh, the, the, the spreadum series of the spreadum determinant, and you see that inside you have to integrate, uh, well, what was defined as our correlation function, rho x1, xk. So, this function here now, that is a function of f, f of s, uh, is a uh, appeared in many, many different uh, probability models when you look at uh, large, large n scaling limits. So you have probability models that are defined up to a certain dimension n. You want to look at uh, this large n scaling limit, and it turns out that in many different models you have this function f of s popping up, describing certain uh, quantities. So the, but before to <laughs> cite the some of this mm, of this uh, of these models, I want just to uh, underline a remarkable structure of that the Airy kernel has. So, if you define it's not it's just an algebraic uh, structure, but so if you define these two-dimensional vectors f and g in terms of the Airy function, you can see that your kernel k Airy x y can be written in this form, where this um, uh, denominator is uh, well defined in the sense that when you look at the diagonal this is zero so you can define this object also along the diagonal and well when you have such a kernel um, it is uh, a, a kernel that is called uh, of integrable IIKS uh, structure IIKS stays but for its Isaac and Korapin and Slapnov that initiated the, the study of freedom determinants associated to these uh, operators that had such a kernel. And actually they studied, in this paper, they were studying quantum correlation um, functions for uh, both the gases, so something that was really coming from a physical background. And it just turned out that the quantities, these quantum correlation functions, they were expressed in terms of freedom determinant, not of this kernel, but a kernel that had this special structure. And um, they initiated this theory uh, that uh, says, in, in a sense, that if you want to study this freedom determinant, well, you have to put a parameter S in some way by scaling or shifting your, your kernel, your initial kernel. Well, you can do it through methods of complex analysis. So, in a sense, um, you can completely characterize uh, the resultant of the operator and so also its random determinant through a um, Riemann-Hilbert problem. That who, who does not know who is, what is the Riemann-Hilbert problem essentially is uh, um, a problem where you are looking for an analytic uh, function that is, uh, um, well, not analytic everywhere, so you will have a counter to define your Riemann-Hilbert problem and so what is called a jump uh, matrix. And um, what uh, you want is to find a function, let's say, psi, 
such that, uh, well, in this specific case, it will be analytic in the upper complex plane, in the lower complex plane, because our sigma here is uh, the real line. And uh, the way you pass from uh, psi plus and psi minus, so your functions that are analytic uh, on uh, the upper complex plane and the lower complex plane, is by multiplying by this jump matrix G. And, well, in their theory, what happens is that if you can solve this such a Riemann Hilbert problem with a jump that de de depends on your uh, your data, F and G, so the, the vectors that enters in your kernel and the real line that is uh, the space where your integral operator is acting, uh, then you can characterize the resolvent of the operator and the Fredon determinant. Okay? And that helped them to write down uh, asymptotics for this quantum correlation function and so on. So now this theory is very well. So if you get such a psi, how do you get back the... Yeah, this, is, this is not straightforward. I mean, this is an old theory that they developed. And, well, what happens is that it's... Um, um, so, essentially, your uh, present determinant will be encoded by... Uh, the asymptotic behavior of plus infinity of this psi. Okay, you will have, but it's not like uh, uh, straightforward. You have to do to, to see how this psi behaves uh, at plus infinity, and then uh, this will be some residue computation will give you back the Fresnel determinant. Okay, so but this is just the detail, and this is just. Uh, I wanted to notice that because this is the way that we proved and we generalized uh, this uh, theory in the other cases. So now, about the appearances of this function f of s. So now let's focus just on the spread of the terminal depending on a parameter s. And uh, where, uh, where is this uh, function f of s appear? Well, one of uh, the main uh, model where it appears is uh, the Gaussian unitary ensemble in random matrix theory. So what happens is that you want to study a random matrix, so you, can, you take an Hermitian n by n um, matrix that has entries that are random, and you take it in, sorry, in this uh, specific sense so that you have this uh, distribution that is given by a partition function times an exponential that depends just on the trace of your matrix M square. And uh, when you have such a random uh, matrix, you want to study, for example, the eigenvalues. So in general, the spectral properties, in particular, the eigenvalues. And it turned out that the eigenvalues of uh, such a random matrix uh, are described exactly by a determinantal point process. So the correlation function of uh, the eigenvalues that now are all real, so they, they, they are on the real line, because we are looking at mission matrices, uh, they really are encoded by a determinantal point process, and this is uh, uh, explicitly written in terms of correlation kernel that depends on the size of the matrix, so Kn. And um, it is written out in terms of the Hermit polynomials. And the point is that now, if you want to know what happens in the large and limit, so as I was saying before, now we want to put to, to, to see what happened uh, what happened to this model when we take large n, so big matrices. What happens to its uh, spectrum? And uh, one of the main uh, one of the main uh, theorem that has been proved with the Forrester, for example, in 93, is that uh, you can characterize the limiting behavior of the largest eigenvalue in this uh, GUE model near the edge by this Fredon determinant. So the probability distribution function, the limiting behavior of the probability distribution function of the largest eigenvalue, properly rescaled and centered, uh, is in the edge is given by f of s. So this, this spread on determinant that we just uh, saw before. Here is, uh, here is a plot of that. And this is one of uh, the first models where this uh, spread on determinant appear. But there are other very interesting models that seems to have nothing to do with that. So um, um, 
consider now the symmetric group of dimension n. Uh, you have, uh, and you put on that um, uniform distribution so that uh, every um, permutation that you would like to have uh, appears with probability one over n factorial. And now one of the quantities is a random model again that depends on uh, this uh, this uh, dimension uh, this uh, dimension n. And one of the quantities of interest was the length of the longest increased subsequence of your permutation of your random permutation. So let's say that we have what, what is that? Well, simply just say that you have a permutation here. This p five for n equal five. You look for the increasing subsequences of this permutation, and you want to measure in some way the behavior of the length of the longest increasing subsequence that you have. And uh, well, it was a very well, quite old problem, this Ulam problem, to describe the behavior of the length of the longest increasing subsequence of, um, of this random permutation for a large n, again. And uh, what was uh, then proved by Bike, Dyson, and Johnson in 1999 is that the limiting behavior of the length of the longest increasing stack sequence for random permutation with uniform distribution is again given by this uh, fragment determinant of the area curve. Okay? So now, uh, you would say to me, where are determinants of point process here? We are talking about the random permutations, where are our points on the real line? Why? is uh, the distribution function of a largest particle in a certain determinant point process giving this limiting behavior? Well, there is now a very well-known explanation of that. So uh, this uh, random problem, this random model of random permutation can be understood in terms of determinant point process on the real line. So the fact that this f of s describes this limiting behavior of the length of the longest increasing subsequence is not just by, it's not a coincidence. Uh, but this is a kind of a long story, so I won't go through that. But then, well, there are many other occurrences where this uh, problem determinant uh, gives you interesting, uh, interesting limiting behavior in a model. So, well, in a pre fermion trap uh, at zero temperature with a certain uh, potential, it was known from 2013, and this is related to the GOE um, matrix model that we just saw, that the limiting behavior of the positions of this fermions is given by this fermion determinant. Then, well, in the same paper that I just cited by Bikelet and Johansson, they, well, kind of passed to another model, uh, to give the result for the random permutation, and this other model is the random partition taken with respect to Poissonized Blanchard measure that, well, is indeed well connected to the problem of random permutations, but still give you, gives you another, another random, uh, in another model where you can find the, this f of s uh, describing interesting, uh, interesting quantities, and finally also in last, uh, it's, it also appears like the limiting behavior of the last passage time in direct last passage percolation models. So, really, there are a lot of uh, different models. Well, this is actually also connected to this first, pro this second problem, but still. So, so this. Uh, 
partnerships. So now about the so this is what I wanted to say about the integrable probability models where this function f of s appears, and now on the other side I would like to um, connect this uh, function f of s uh, to classical integrable systems. And um, well, one of uh, the main formula that uh, allows you to express uh, the trend determinant f of s was. Uh, computed by Tracy and Widow in 1994, and it allows you to express the um, you know, freedom determinant f of s, that so it in principle defines through a freedom series with certain complicated objects, in terms of one particular function, that is a nonlinear special function, that is called the asymmetric solution of the Pavelitz equation. So you have that uh, the second derivative of the logarithm of your f of s, is just given in terms of this function u squared. And um, what happens is that this function u is a unique solution of a boundary value problem when you consider this different nonlinear differential equation here, that is uh, the Pavelitz two equation with constant uh, term that is equal to zero, and uh, a boundary condition of this type. So, um, the, the Asinger MacLeod proved that this such a boundary value problem has a unique, uh, has, has a unique solution, and uh, the solution is called by, <laughs> by their names as the Asinger MacLeod solution of this P2 equation. And, well, thanks to the property of Q of S, you finally get uh, integrating an expression for F of S that then is also called the Tracy Widow distribution, also thanks to this uh, characterization of the present determinant f of s in terms of um, such a function u. So now, just a few remarks about Pauli's equations, because, uh, well, they are a kind of a specific object. So Pauli's equations were born from a general uh, and very analytic problem in the end of uh, the 19th century. So they wanted, uh, so Valade wanted to describe uh, all the uh, second order nonlinear ODEs of type uh, W second equal to a certain function of uh, your W, W prime and the variable T, uh, such that there are no movable branch points. So the branch points does not do not depend on the um, initial data that you want to put to solve your nonlinear ID. And uh, what it turns out is that actually there are just six of such equations that have this uh, so-called Pavelet properties now. And uh, these uh, are known as the six Pavelet equations. And sorry, so, so there are only six such equations that cannot be solved in terms of known spatial functions. So you can't for a generic value of the parameter, find a solution of your ODE that is written in terms of, I don't know, either geometric function, Bessel function, or whatever special function you would like to. And uh, so their solution has a name, because uh, since you have this Pandeve properties, property, uh, you can still define functions out of the solution of your uh, nonlinear ODE. And uh, these are called Pandeve transcendent. So it's for that reason that this function U of S, uh, even though, okay, uh, it could be uh, like uh, very uh, not uh, known, not special for, for anybody, but it, it came out from a very, what is now called a new class of nonlinear special function. Okay, so about wh why I, I say just before that these are in some way related to classical integrable system is because uh, Every one of these six Pandeve equations has been um, found um, to have a lax pair. So having a lax pair, it means uh, by the, the Japanese school um, in the 80s. So this means that you can in some way linearize these uh, equations. And how do you do that? Is uh, in the following way. You take uh, your, um, your this, now this subside here, is a, a matrix valid function in the complex plane that depends on a further parameter t. 
and uh, you look at a um, linear differential equation written here, and uh, this is isomonodrom. This should be isomonodromic in the parameter t in the sense that you don't want the monodromy of uh, the solution of coming out from here to be dependent on the extra parameter t. So this is the reason why this is called an isomonodromic flat sphere. And what they prove is that every kind of equation can be written, is completely encoded by such a system, where of course A and B will be different polynomials or rational matrices in, in lambda and T. And uh, this in particular means that you, if you take the compatibility condition of the system, so the fact that you can exchange uh, the order of derivatives, well, this equation here, will give you exactly the Palladé equation and the nth Palladé equation, okay? And moreover, they all have a Newtonian formulation. So you can see these Palladé equations as a Newtonian one-dimensional system. And, uh, well, this is not unrelated, but another very interesting and important property of Palladé equations is that they are all conjectured to be actually subsidiary reduction of integrable PDEs. Now, in particular, for the Panevé 2 equation, this is true, and the Panevé 2 equation arises out from a subsimilarity reduction of the cortex deviate or modified cortex deviate equation. You can derive it from both of them. And I said them because, well, they are, uh, KDV is considered as the first uh, integrable system in infinite dimensional setting. So, this Pauline equation has really remarkable properties, and uh, that's all what I wanted to say. So let's skip now to the finite temperature case. So this is all I wanted to say about the classical results known from the equation and the, the, the connection that there is between um, integrable probability model and integrable classical integrable system. Now, uh, what is the finite temperature Ikenna? Well, it can be defined in a generic way, uh, by taking certain wave function sigma that, well, uh, just to have good definition, could be a sigma with uh, the takes uh, values in 0, 1, divided on the real life, a smooth, uh, well, you can take uh, an undefined number of points uh, for the singularity, and that is exponentially fast going to 1 at plus infinity and to 0 minus infinity. Now, with the, such a function, you modify the, the Eric Kerner that we just saw before in the following way. Instead of taking, remember that there were two, um, I'm, I'm just, um, there were two ways to characterize the Eric Kerner, and one was by taking an integral from zero to plus infinity of just the product of two Eric functions. Now, what we do to get this finite uh, temperature version is that we take the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, so on the old real line, but instead of having just these two area functions, you, only, you also have this uh, sigma function here, this wave function. So this is the finite temperature you can, and uh, the operator k area sigma s, um, where I already put the parameter s that before was the, the the edge of the interval S plus infinity inside is the finite temperature kernel. And, uh, well, this finite temperature kernel and its spread on the terminal that now depends also on the function sigma appeared uh, uh, maybe not for the first time, uh, but um, for sure in uh, the, that's, that was the time where it became popular, a popular object as the F of S that we saw before is uh, in connection with this kardar parisi zang equation. So now, this kardar parisi zang equation is a stochastic PDE that is uh, written here. So you have uh, a height function, h, that depends on both a special variable and a time variable. And uh, it is perturbed by a uh, Gaussian space-time white noise that is here. And, uh, it turned out that uh, this stochastic PDE happens to govern many different uh, random growth modes. So now your hx of t is the height function of uh, some interface that is growing randomly. And uh, in many different models, it turned out that 
acetylic solution of the stochastic PDE was encoding this uh, random growth um, model of the interface that you're looking at. So I took, uh, for example, this uh, uh, picture here that from, is from Takeuchi and Sano, where they uh, were looking to grow in interfaces of turbulent liquid gas crystals. So now I, I, <laughs> I don't know exactly what, uh, what they were, uh, I mean, looking at, but uh, in certain sense you have uh, this liquid crystal that is perturbed in some way and uh, the, you see the perturbation uh, that is described by the interfaces between the, the black region and the grey region that is defined, I mean, can be approximated by a solution of the KPZ equation if you look at the X and T dependence, spatial and time dependence. And in particular, there is a specific uh, uh, solution of this KPZ equation that appears to be related to the finite temperature air kernel, and it's in particular it's shadow determinant, and this was uh, uh, proved by Amir Corwin and Cancel in 2011, where they proved that, okay, so you have to to do a bit of work in order to define properly what is the solution of uh, this uh, PDE, but what they do is to take uh, um, is to take uh, this logarithm of z of x of t as uh, your function h. So in this way, z x t is the solution of the stochastic uh, heat equation. That is an object that uh, for uh, people in stochastic PDE is more um, known and more e and easier to treat. And what they, they, do they prove is that um, this kind of solution, when you take narrow edge initial condition, so at time zero you have that the z x zero is just the delta function in zero, then this solution x h x of t, uh, h of x and t as a probability distribution function that is given by this formula here, what, what I want you to notice is that this is a random determinant is a part from scaling and inserting the time dependence, so the parameter t, is a random determinant of the finite temperature area kernel that I just showed you, but when you pick sigma to be a specific uh, weight function, not the general weight function, but sigma should be the sigma kpz uh, written here, okay? Yeah. So you see that is a complex contribute or? No, 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 it's just another variable. Oh, yeah. That goes in this uh, gamma that is a uh, uh, angle, uh, it's, it's a, a contour that is uh, taking, uh, um, it's integrating the positive part of the real axis, but it has to be well defined. Uh, so, no, 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 no. It's another variable that is defined along this counter gamma that is um, that is some counter that turns around the positive part of the real line. And z, the z dependence here is just in the exponent of uh, the exponential function. Okay, so um, this is this was uh, again as I said not the first time where it's random determinant of the finite temperature area kernel uh, appeared, but it was for sure uh, the time where it was most popular, also because in this same paper, Amir, Corin, and Castell proved that there is a generalization of the tracing with them formula that I just showed in the very first slide, where the random determinant of the standard area kernel was characterized in terms of a specific function, that you, that solution of the Pandelito equation that I talked about. And in their generalization, what did, did they do was uh, the following thing. So they described this uh, random determinant as sigma s. Now I just uh, eliminated the t dependence uh, because there are only there are too many parameters. But um, it's still uh, after scaling the same object. And uh, this random determinant here, so when you take the sigma function inside the definition of your area kernel, uh, and the dependence on the dependence on, on the parameter s is still completely determined in terms of a function that now is this bar phi here. Now, of course, it's 
not exactly the same thing as before because you have to take an integral all over the real line and uh, of this phi square and multiply by the derivative of your sigma function, the specific sigma function that appeared in their work. But the point is that now this var phi is a solution of uh, this, what is now called the integral differential part of this equation. That is this uh, equation here. So you have still a second uh, derivative of var phi that should be equal to a linear term that is given by phi zs multiplied by z plus s plus a nonlinear term that is now in some way integral differential because you have to integrate all along phi square over sigma prime and then multiply by phi. And you have a specific boundary behavior again. So a few words about uh, this result. And first of all, Catch what you intend to call temperature on this problem. Can, can you I'll come to that uh, in the next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, so this result that I just showed, that I will call for the rest of the talk a generalization of the Tracy Widow formula, uh, has been proved uh, for the general class of sigma functions that I showed you before. So, not just for the sigma kz, the specific function appearing in the work of Amir Corbin and Castell, but for a uh, large class of uh, weight functions uh, and through many different methods. Now, why, uh, second thing that I want to say, why this is so the, <laughs> why, why we can say that this is the Tracy Widow generali generalization, um, is because now suppose that you take uh, sigma as the characteristic function of zero plus infinity, then what you get is that the var phi uh, appearing just before is exactly the function u of s that I showed you. Why is that? Well, because if you now you say if you now take the sigma function um, being the characteristic function of zero plus infinity, then sigma prime will be just delta function in zero. So in this integral here, what you are left with is var phi squared in zero s. Okay, and uh, if you look at the integral differential equation, what happens is that now, again, if you look at the behavior of var phi zero s, so that is equal to zero, that is equal to zero here, it disappears. So you have the second derivative in s of phi zero s equal to s plus again this integral integral that is just now phi squared in zero s because sigma prime is the delta function in zero, times phi. And so you get back exactly the Palevetu equation for the variable phi zero s, okay? And well, if you look at the boundary behavior now, phi zero s is, it has to go like the area function just in the variable s. So this is the reason why we call this result, the generalization, this old result, the generalization of the Tracy Williams formula, because really if you take sigma being the characteristic function of a semi-infinite interval, then you go back to the Tracy Williams result in terms of the standard uh, Palladio equation. And um, now F sigma S has appeared in other integrable probability models and very recently, it appeared in this uh, weak non-hermeticity limit of the context elliptic Ginebra ensemble. And uh, this is very nice uh, because, uh, so when you consider complex elliptic Ginebra ensemble, this is another random matrix ensemble where now you are looking at random matrices uh, that have some probability measure on them. But the point is that since uh, you are not anymore emission, your eigenvalues are in the complex plane. So what it has been proved uh, for, uh, for this complex elliptic Ginebra ensemble is that if you look at, the, for example, the real part or the imaginary part of the eigenvalues of the matrix, of this random matrix, you can still encode them through determinantal point processes. But this will be on a two-dimensional, uh, on, on the entire complex plane, not just on the real line. So if you look at the limiting behavior of the largest particle in this random matrix model, first of all, you have to define what is the largest particle, because now your eigenvalues are in the complex plane, so it could be with respect to the radium, or with respect to the real part, or the imaginary part that you are looking for the 
largest particle. But one thing we're able to prove is that there is a, a limit uh, that is called non hermeticity but uh, or which non hermeticity I will not go into the details, but where the probability distribution of the largest particle in this model is again encoded by f sigma s. So this is the finite temperature return, where now the sigma function, the weight function, is another but specific function uh, that you have to pick up. And the way that they prove it, it was by using this characterization in terms of integral differential quadratic equation. So by recognizing that the quantity that they were studying the limiting behavior of this uh, largest particle, where largest should be defined in some sense, is something that uh, solves this Tracy Widom generalization formula. Okay, so now uh, another model where this finite temperature you can turn in uh, is given from when you consider this free fermionic uh, systems, but at finite temp that are chopped uh, with certain potential, but at finite temperature. So this is the reason why it is called finite temperature factoring. And um, uh, what uh, what has been uh, done in the literature uh, is that now if you consider n free fermions in um, in one dimension, so this this was on the real line that are described by uh, one particle in Newtonian in this way. And here is the, your potential, Q to the power to N. And um, the not the Eigen function related uh, to this energy by Psi K. This can be written in, of Q1, Qn. This can be written in terms of a finite size determinant uh, of dimension N times N, uh, where now, uh, C, K, J are the eigen functions uh, written uh, in here for every eigen value lambda, lambda K. And uh, now, what has been proved by, for example, Dean, Lebusson, Marina, and Scherer for a generic potential is that uh, when you consider this system at finite temperature, T, that is, uh, okay, B minus 1, uh, according to this Boltzmann Gibbs, Gibbs distribution, the probability density function is given by by uh, by uh, this expression here, where you have your finite size determinant that is uh, inside, and the partition function written here. And the point is that now, if you want to study the limiting behavior of the largest uh, coordinates, so the largest uh, Q, the, other, the largest position in your uh, in your system of free fermions uh, at finite temperature, so where where beta, that is the inverse temperature, is rescaled up to this alpha, and alpha is up here in the weight, that is the Fermi factor. Uh, now, this limiting behavior of the largest uh, position is given by your F sigma s, so the present determinant of the finite temperature region, where the sigma function is taken exactly as uh, this uh, function here, the Fermi factor. So this is the reason why we call uh, this generalization finite temperature. Here we go. Because in, if you consider the same system at zero temperature, it was known by the work of Eisler, for example, that, well, the limiting behavior of the largest particle uh, position in the system will be given just by the standard uh, Eric so without sigma being the characteristic function. Oh. The small n in the Hamiltonian, is it equal to or related to the big N? Or no, no. So now n is uh, the number of fermions that you are taking and that you are going to send to plus infinity in the limiting case. Small n is the power that you take in the potential, q to the power to n. No, indeed. This is, thank you, because this is very important. So the point is that independently on n, the limiting behavior will be always given by this F C minus. Okay? When N integer N, positive integer N. But I think that there is some universality results, but I'm not sure I should check, uh, that tells you how you can that you can take a bigger class of potential here, not just these powers of 2n, but I have to check for that. But in, in this work, I think that they were considering integers, positive integer powers of n, little n. 
small n as disappearing in the result? Yeah, 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 exactly. So the limiting behavior of the largest position, properly scaled and centered uh, at the edge, is always given by the present determinant of the finite temperature equation that does not depend on a little x. This is, uh, the, the, uh, the, this is the point of this result, the old point of this result. And, well, also the point of the generalization to the higher order equation, because uh, uh, this was the main motivation for us to consider this higher order high temperature equation, and uh, in particular, the motivation comes as follows. So now, uh, define another air kernel that is now higher order in the sense that you will be considering higher order air function. So this uh, little n um, appears here and here. So if for n equal 1, you go back to the classical air function. Otherwise, you will have this object here. With that in mind, you construct the nth air kernel, and uh, uh, this is given by this integral from 0 to plus infinity to this 2 to the product um, of the product of the two nth air functions. And uh, now you take the finite temperature version of that. So again, you pick up your favorite function sigma that well behaves so that this integral on the real line is well defined. But now you have, again, the product of n theta function, not just the first standard classical theta function. And if you consider now the same uh, free fermions model that I just uh, showed you before, and you want to study the moment of, uh, the, of, the, of the model and not the position, so you put yourself in the moment representation. Uh, now the the moments are still on the real line, right? Uh, they are n uh, random variables. You would like to study them. Well, apparently they uh, do not behave exactly as the determinant point process. But in this paper by the Sam Machunda and Share of 2018, they were able to prove that in the large n behavior, so again, now n is capital N, so the number of particles, you put that, them uh, to infinity, and the largest uh, momentum is described by this n-depending, um, n-depending, little n-depending <laughs> um, uh, formula, so that the density of the moment is described in this way, and uh, it is zero, not last the near the edge, not la as the square root of n, but as something that depends on little n, so one over two n. And in particular, with this in mind, they were able to prove that there are some constant, depending again on the little n, uh, that describes the limiting behavior of the largest uh, moment of the system. And this time, this depends on little n. This time, this limiting behavior here is described in terms of f sigma and f. And uh, this is this present determinant here where now you have the higher order finite temperature very kernel. So this guy here, that highly depends on the little n parameter. So the, that was the power of the potential in the system at the very beginning. So uh, uh, what's the differential equation for uh, A and N? So it's... Um, Yeah, this little, yeah, yeah, yeah. It will be the next uh, time, times x. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. This is, uh, so this uh, little line is uh, the little line there. Okay, so this motivated us uh, to study this uh, higher order finite temperature area kernel in uh, the specific setting, and uh, this is what we proved with um, Thomas Botner and Mattia Capasso. So again, a generalization of the Tracy Wheaton formula. Uh, but now you will see the dependence on, on n, on the little n, also in the integrable uh, 
uh, plus non-trivial system size, in the sense that, again, you can characterize uh, your uh, Fresnel determinant of, well, the logarithm of the Fresnel determinant, second derivative, in terms of a one unique function var phi. But now this var phi depends on n, on little n. And in which way, well, in, in the following way, it solves um, the nth member of an integral differential for level 2 hierarchy. So if, uh, if this will be an integral differential equation that is now of order 2n, so same order as this uh, equation. And um, why it's called it like that? Because it's an integral differential version of the classical Pandele 2 hierarchy that is very well known. And indeed, this result uh, for the sigma being the characteristic function, so uh, the zero temperature case, but when you study higher order uh, airy kernels, so in this, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, in this setting here, you put sigma the characteristic function, but you keep the dependence on n. Well, this result, uh, that we have recall exactly the result that was proved by Capasso Pedro in 2019 for the zero temperature higher order air kernels. And this was connected to the standard Pallavet 2 hierarchy. This, this Pallavet 2 hierarchy is a, a sequence of uh, an infinite sequence of nonlinear ODEs. The first one is the Pallavet 2 equation. And uh, then you have a uh, fourth order, sixth order, always even order nonlinear differential equation that um, is constructed in a very uh, in a very um, precise way and this construction comes from the fact that the Panavetu equation is a reduction of the KDV, the quantum degree equation and since there is a very standard way to define the KDV hierarchy, so a hierarchy of higher order differential equation PD in that case that are um, that generalize the KDV equation just by doing this uh, self-similarity reduction on all the level you obtain this object that is the Pallavet 2 hierarchy, the sequence of ODEs that generalize the first uh, Pallavet 2 equation. Okay, so just, uh, okay, so this Pallavet 2 hierarchy is written in um, a very nice way, uh, but uh, it's very compact. So you have your, your C plus X times phi, that is, uh, should be equal to the composition of two recursion operators, LP plus, LP minus, uh, that are composed n times uh, and applied to the function phi xx. Now, uh, this definition, we should skip it then and um, go directly to the first example. Yes. So, now here are the first equation of the hierarchy, this integral differential hierarchy. Now, this uh, bracket. Uh, here denotes uh, the, um, the integral. Also, this is just the scalar product of the uh, n to r with respect to your the derivative of your favorite uh, weight function. And um, what well, if you now this is exactly. Again, uh, the, 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 equation, the integral differential equation that we saw for uh, Amiel Corwin and Castell work. And for n equal to n equal 3, you see appearing fourth order and sixth order differential equations, integral differential equations. And again, if you take sigma being the characteristic function, so sigma prime, the delta function is 0, and you look at this equation for the variable phi 0x, this reduces to the classical Pallet uh, 2 equations. Okay. Uh, so I skip the method and I will say just five minutes more. Yeah. Um, so I will skip about the method. Doesn't matter. Uh, so this uh, second work instead that we did with uh, uh, some plays in Gabriel Glaser and Julio Luzza. Uh, it's about another generalization that you can take of the finite temperature area kernel. Uh, and uh, this describes in this was not motivated actually. Uh, from models uh, in physics or other models in uh, probability, but just from theory of determinants of point processes. So, uh, what we are now going to do is to, uh, we are going to thin our determinants of point process that was defined through the area kernel, so the, the very first determinants of point process that I showed you 
at the very beginning, and uh, we pinned it with uh, a sigma function. Here, the sigma will be the same sigma function that was the weight before. And what does that mean? It means that for every random configuration that you psi that you could have in your determination point process uh, given by the airy kernel, you now independently eliminate a particle that is in the size psi j with probability 1 minus sigma psi j, so sigma evaluated in the position of the particle in the process, and you keep it with probability sigma of uh, psi j. And uh, well, for a sigma that behaves like that, it is very similar to the Fermi vector, uh, so the function the sigma that was appearing in the in the three fermionic model, um, you will have that in some sense you are cutting the particles that are on the left. And uh, so what happens is that now this uh, new process that you are obtaining by taking the early point process, if you pick up sigma that is enough uh, decreasing on the, on, at minus infinity, this has almost surely a finite number of particles. And so you can ask yourself, what is the probability of having exactly a configuration that counts n particles, exactly n particles? And this probability wants to be zero in principle because now you know that almost sure we have uh, a finite number of particles. And um, now, uh, the quantity that describes you this uh, configuration of uh, having exactly n points um, at uh, V1, Vn, let's say, that are now fixed the points on the real lines, is defined, again, this is standard uh, theory of the determination point process, uh, by a Fredon type series of this, of this uh, written in this way. So now, rows S is uh, the correlation function of the uh, Erie kernel, so you can write it down as a finite size determinant of the K area in your kernel evaluated at the points. This is the same thing that we saw at the beginning, but just now you have to take the n plus m correlation function. So the first variable, lambda 1, lambda m, will be integrated out, and uh, what is left uh, is the dependence on the v1, vm, the point that was fixed at the beginning, and for which we want to know what is the probability of having exactly v1, vm in our configuration in the thinner point process. And uh, another, well, standard manipulation of this subframe series gives you that in the end, this is just given by a product of two factors that are very nice because this is the present determinant of 1 minus sigma k area s, and this is indeed uh, through just a standard, uh, standard uh, properties of present determinants, the same as sigma s that we had at the beginning. So this is the present determinant of the finite temperature area kernel, F sigma s, and what is left in the right hand side is quite innocent uh, finite uh, dimensional determinant. Uh, so this is a determinant of matrix M by M, and this matrix is constructed by evaluating this two-dimensional uh, function, two-variable function, L A R sigma s, which is the kernel of the resolvent operator of your uh, of your uh, finite temperature airy kernel. And uh, our point was that indeed you don't have only f sigma, sorry, you don't have only f sigma s, so the present determinant that is uh, defined uniquely in terms of a certain integrable system, so in terms of this function by phi z s, but also this quantity here, j sigma by s, just the nth velocity density of uh, the thinned airy process is also encoded by this same uh, integral differential Pandeve 2 solution. And this is, uh, one can see it in two ways, so either just by noticing that through that factorization you have this factor here that is known by Amit, Carmen, and Castell and all the generalization that follows that independently on the function f, uh, on the function sigma, you can write it down in terms of the solution of uh, the integral pa differential parallel equation, but also this finite size determinant is written down in terms of that same solution because you have this characterization here. And again, you see that this kernel, that is the resolvent uh, of the kernel of the resolvent of the finite temperature, airy kernel, 
has two representation, one um, by integration, the other one in this uh, form, that are exactly as for the air kernel. And uh, the other one is like that, it is more similar to a tracer with a shape in the sense that you can compute the second derivative of the logarithm of this new J sigma Vs, this antigen oxidancy of the thinner process. And this, just to keep the point here, but this will be encoded by this integral here. And now, in some sense, what you are doing is just uh, changing the weight function with respect to the one you were integrating before. So, in this sense, if V, so the number of points uh, that you fixed at the beginning is the empty set, then this blue term that is appearing here just does not exist. And G, G sigma Vs is just the present determinant. You don't have the finite size determinant that factors out because you have no particles. And this is back uh, again to, to, to the Amilcar and Castell representation of the present determinant of the finite temperature term. And now this function P uh, depends on the points V and is obtained by an explicit double transformation of, uh, of the previous one. So the, the one that solves V into the differential side representation. Okay, so this was about the method, but I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. Other questions? On, uh, well, maybe it appears several times in your talk, but in, uh, at least what is the, in the integral uh, differential equation, uh, let's say for the, for the finite temperature, like a uh, variable z, and at least what is. Uh, yeah. uh, so, so, you, so you say that for uh, you, yes, you say that you would recover uh, with sigma being the, the heavy side function, and, uh, and z equals zero, you would recover the. So, the point is that now, so sigma is the characteristic function, uh, and uh, if you look at that equation for a general z, uh, what happens in this case is that uh, you will have um, uh, z plus s plus p times uh, now the integral that becomes uh, uh, this sigma okay this was r pr uh, times z x now in this uh, for this choice this uh, is delta zero r so you evaluate this integral just by putting the integrating variable as zero. And uh, now, well, this still depends on z. So this is not the polyvalent equation. You have an extra variable. The polyvalent equation is obtained when you take uh, z equal to zero. So now you eliminate the z variable. You rewrite this uh, differential set. Uh, you write this differential equation now for z equal zero. This is really just so this is zero. This is s times uh, phi zero s plus uh, this is a two in front, and so this is the Bonnevet equation. Was that the question? My, my question was what is the role of z? Is uh, uh, there an interpretation for this uh, third parameter? Or? Uh, I mean, uh, the, this parameter is. I mean, the reason why is that is now you are considering everything that uh, depends on this uh, sigma function, and so you have this uh, uh, this uh, representation in terms of a function of uh, two variables, and one of them is integrated out with the sigma prime. Now, in terms of the differential equations, uh, I don't uh, know. Uh, I mean, you can see this was written in the slide just so below. This equation also has a Schrodinger equation, where now you have a, a potential here that is very explicit, and it's written in terms of the 
pi uh, function. So if you can this case just to give you just uh, to make it up uh, the right thing. So this would be <coughs> that plus f plus uh, u of uh, uh, now this is an order s, but depends on sigma times u of that s. And uh, so well yeah, that is the spectral variable in the Schrodinger equation, if you want. If you, but now you, this u is not a generic potential. It's given by this integral, this specific integral. But otherwise, I don't know about the interpretation of this second variable. Of the potential in uh, sigma, sigma depends on uh, sigma depends on the sigma. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sigma, this is what I was trying to say before. So, uh, sigma, the, the variable of the weight is the variable, the first variable of R phi, the one that you integrate out in the representation formula. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. 